to our very first Hidden Gems interview. Um, we're doing these because we want to share with the whole world some of the amazing people in this world that are doing amazing things that we just don't really hear about and all the things they believe in, love and want to share with the world too. That's why we're doing this. Today we have the wonderful Mika Lam. So Mika Lam is here with us today and she's talking to us about Fashion Revolution Week. Who knew this was a thing? Did you know this was a thing? I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know this was a thing until last week, week before, I heard Mika talking at a networking meeting and I went, oh, it's a thing. That's an amazing thing. But the thing is what she's going to tell us about. I'm not going to say any more. Mika, what is Fashion Revolution Week? Fashion Revolution Week is absolutely a thing. And it's a thing to raise awareness. So it happens at this time of year because this is the anniversary of a huge disaster known as the Rana Plaza disaster. And the Rana Plaza was a building that housed a number of different factories, all making clothes for big Western brands. And the factory building wasn't safe. And one day, some cracks started to appear in the walls and the people working in the factory said, that doesn't look okay. And they tried to leave. But because they are part of a, a massive cycle of cheap labour, labour and poverty. These are people who don't have very many choices. Their employers don't have very many choices. They don't get paid if they don't make thousands of garments every day. So basically they weren't allowed to leave. They weren't allowed to leave their stations, even though they could see these cracks appearing in the walls and they knew that their building was unsafe. And sure enough, it collapsed. The whole building collapsed and it's the fourth biggest industrial disaster in history wow and so <laughs> many people died over a thousand people died and actually the number is close to the number of people who died on the Titanic it's a big thing and people who work in ethical fashion and were concerned about something like this just, you know, they'd been talking to the blue in the face for so many years, and then finally they were like, we've told you. <laughs> like, wow. this has happened, it's a huge disaster, and, and even after that happened, it took a lot of effort for anyone to, to admit accountability. Yeah. So the first thing, of course, that big brands did was they said, well, we don't use that factory, so it has nothing to do with us. And what happened was when people were cleaning up the rubble, they would find labels for all the brands that are on our high street. And they said, well, you do use this. And the reason that they didn't even know is because there's a supply chain now that is so enormously long mm. and so out of anyone's control that most people don't know where their clothes are made. And they certainly don't know who made their clothes. So Fashion Revolution Week decided well it kind of was born out of that disaster and on the anniversary of that disaster every year they encourage people to ask the question who made my clothes because when you ask that question it means the the brand the manufacturer answering it they have to work out where their clothes are made and they have to work out what individual person made their clothes and and they have to admit that they're being made actually by human people. You know, not just numbers, not just some factory somewhere, God knows where, but human people. Mm. So that's why that question is really, really important. And it's really easy to, to question because um, the whole um, of Fashion Revolution Week as a, an awareness raising campaign relies on social media. So what you do is you can put your jumper or whatever you're wearing on inside out you take a picture of the label and then you tweet or Instagram or Facebook um, and you say to whoever that is, like Gap, you say, mm. dear Gap, hashtag, who made my clothes? It's like that simple and it's a massively impactful question and, and they either can answer it or they can't. And what's great is that when some people answer it, Actually, it gives them a little bit of a platform to talk about the fact that, that they do things right mm. and 
and you get to give them a bit of a pat on the back. And you'd be really surprised actually which brands do have a close relationship with their factories, who pay attention, who know the people who work there, have seen their condition, they have a relationship because they go and visit the factory quite often. And then also there are the brands who just cannot answer that question whatsoever. And it's our way of saying you need to do better. What was so impactful about that one event that made people go, look, actually stand up now? I don't want to ask this very well. But well, the, yeah. the main impact of that event was mm. basically because it hit the news. Okay. Um, and also, you know, the stories that came out, you know, where people were saying, we tried to leave the building and weren't allowed to. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was so heartbreaking to watch. And yeah. of course, watching it, everyone said, well, why? Why? Mm. And once you start asking questions, the, yeah. the answers come out. That says something about our culture, though, that it takes something to get in the news for us to realise there are people involved. And so I get the impact that doing that social media campaign can have this whole theme of Fashion Revolution Week because it took, that was obviously happening for decades, really, this kind of factory working stuff that's going on where people are not earning their value or the value of the work they're doing and in conditions that are terrible, but the fact that only then, because it was such a big scale, it got into the news, then mm. there's the change. So all of us know the power of social media, obviously, exactly. and sharing stuff like this. So tell us again how we get involved with Fashion Revolution Week and what impact does that make? Well, there's various things you can do. So mm -hmm. if you're following me on any of my social media channels, mm -hmm. then I'll be posting stuff all the time. Which we will put in the links to this, by the way. Yeah. Um, and they have a website, fashionrevolution.org. So basically, you can do anything from that basic little tweet, yeah, which will take you 30 seconds, um, or you can go to the website and they have a little template for an email, if you want to send something like a bit longer to a brand that you like. Um, and it just words it for you. Obviously, you can write your own, but it's there if you're short on time. And there are loads of events going on all around the world. Because you said you didn't, you were really surprised by mm. what I just told you about the Rana Plaza and ethical fashion, and it had never occurred to you. And that's not really a coincidence. Mm. So, um, another thing I know that you're interested in is, you know, when I talk about shopping and how you can feel a bit shit about yourself. Yeah. Also, not a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> because <clears throat> if you think about clothing, um, over say the last 50 or 60 years you will realize that it has become cheaper well everything else has become more expensive it's a very fast commodity it's almost like fast food quick quick chuck it away it's actually yeah. exactly that yeah yeah because there was a very shift when people in marketing who do what I do um, they suddenly realized hang on a minute people who I and use um, things like like chewing gum or food or you know something that you can eat up or use up and then have to buy again like a consumable mm. um, that's a perfect customer like they have to keep coming back for more mm. and also in marketing your perfect customer is someone who has a problem to solve yeah? you're always looking to think, how can I solve my customers' problems? Okay. Was that that? Was that that? <laughs> ah, sorry, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that was that one. <laughs> oh, so in terms of marketing, you actually know a lot about that because that's part of one of the things you do that we don't really know much about. We'll get to ask you that in a minute. Continue telling us about naughty marketers. Okay, so what the naughty marketers did is they decided that you were, you were probably a bit too happy to be their ideal customer. What they would prefer is if you had a problem and that they could fix that problem for you with a little bit of retail therapy. So you might have woken up feeling fine about yourself. You might have decided to have a little look in the shops. You might buy something, you might not. But that doesn't really make you an ideal customer. So then you go into the shops and the shops, they, they have their glossy pictures, 
they have their setup, everything's very surface orientated, everything's really geared towards making you feel just a little bit shit about yourself. And and because it's because it's a really good trick, you know, people take that onto themselves. Because that's that's very natural. You think, well, there's no other reason for me to feel so rubbish. All I did was go out for a bit of shopping, but I must just be a bit too fat and a bit too pale and a bit too untrendy. It's probably me. But actually it really isn't. Because the clothes are designed to well, they're not designed, that's the point. They're not made well, they're poorly constructed. So when you put them on, you don't feel full of confidence. You don't feel beautiful and amazing. And that's perfectly good for the shop because then they can, they can say, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe a quick fix will cheer you up. You know, maybe look at the lovely glossy pictures of the happy, happy people with their lovely friends and try and be a bit more like them. And I remember going shopping with my daughter when she was very young. She was only eight or nine. And even she felt like that, because she was a child, she articulated her feelings very bluntly. And she just said, Mummy, I have to buy something here. I can't leave until I buy something here. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I thought, well, why? Like, you don't say that in Waitrose. <laughs> <Like, you know? laughs> What a strange thing for a child to say. And then I realised this is like a very heavy marketing ploy. And I, I feel it too, but because I'm an adult, you know, I have more complex processes and it doesn't kind of hit me right there as hard as it hit her. And then I thought, okay, no, sod that. You don't get to market to my kid and make her feel shit so that we buy your crappy jeans. We went and bought her some slightly more expensive but really well made jeans that have lasted you know three years now and they look great on her still you know and they've got the length and they've got the shape and someone you know has actually designed them properly and they've made them properly and it's a proper garment it's not just you know a shitty piece of high street fashion that is designed deliberately to be disposable because the idea is you feel so crap that you want that little bit of retail therapy, you buy yourself something to cheer yourself up, you get home, and eh, it doesn't fit you that well, and eh, da, 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 but it was so cheap, oh, I can't it. oh so give it to charity or whatever. So how can we change how we buy and how we interact with fashion then? Well, there's loads of ways to do that, but when I spoke to Diana at Dolly Clothing, the one thing that we both really agreed on and both felt quite furious about really was this kind of appropriation of the art of fashion because it is a very beautiful craft and it is very clever you know you can put on a clothes well actually you have no choice in our society we've decided that we all must wear clothes so <laughs> damn it you have to wear clothes <laughs> And you just will express yourself whether you like it or not. You are telling me a lot about yourselves right now just by what you've chosen to wear. And you're both in purple. Mm. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Um, so, so Diana is really into sewing and making clothes that fit perfectly. And because we're not all the same size and shape, she likes to do um, sewing classes or make people bespoke garments and, you know, make it to measure because then you've at least got one thing that when you put it on, you just feel like a million dollars and it's transformative. And that's the real power of clothing and fashion. And that's why people love it. You know, that's why people fall in love with the idea of it. And so we both feel like it's been been taken away and repackaged and sold as this kind of lightweight, glossy, completely other consumerist thing. Very fast food, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, and then behind the scenes, what's happening is unbelievably devastating for, for the rest of our planet, the people who make the clothes, and, and you know, the there's also the issue of waste. 
because you speak about a film that's on Netflix, right? It's called that's The right. True Cost. The True Cost. Yes. I, full disclosure: I don't know anyone involved in the film. <laughs> I plug it only because when people start talking to me about fashion and in particular ethical fashion, there's so much to say and there are so many different levels and there are so many different issues that you start getting a bit swamped and people ask me, what's the one thing I can do to get a clear picture or to take action or to understand these concepts? And I've started saying, watch this film because it's less than an hour and a half and it's just really good at giving you a very clear, well-formulated snapshot of this very complicated issue. Well, it's one of the only documentaries about ethical fashion that doesn't shy away from, from that idea of, of marketing deliberately turning fashion into a consumable want to do something. You can also just start looking at different ways of, of getting hold of your clothes, different ways of dressing yourself. So uh, you can come to the clothes swap on Thursday, for example. Tell us about the clothes swap. The clothes swap. Um, so the clothes swap was Diana's idea, and it's very much in line with her business philosophy of putting the value of clothing into how it makes you feel. At this particular clothes swap, um, Diana is going to set up a live alteration station. Ooh. So there will be... Alteration station. Alteration station. <laughs> so you can get some advice from Diana and also a stylist who's going to be there. And you can actually make alterations right there. And what we decided was that all of the clothes that are being swapped, that people are bringing and taking, they're all free. Mm -hmm. And you can bring as much or as little as you want, and you can take as much or as little as you want. There are no, no transactional value whatsoever oh. on those clothes. But the alterations, that's where we want you to shift your value system onto, mm -hmm. because that's where we think those clothes can, can be made valuable again, because you can make them fit you perfectly or you can turn them into exactly what you want, and they'll be something unique. You can get some advice, you can kind of plug into that nice, playful, fun thing that fashion it's gives like being you. It's like being able to re or reinvent yourself. Yeah. Like without having to spend lots of money and chuck stuff away, you're just recreating your world, aren't you? Exactly. That sounds like fun. We have to go to that. We have to, to go, when is it? Remind it's us. It's on Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> when is it? It starts at 7.30 and it's at the St. John Church Hall on Talbot Terrace. And I'm sure in lots of other areas there's similar things happening, especially around Fashion Revolution Week, where people are doing clothes swaps, encouraging people to go to charity shops, alter clothes. I know um, a stylist in Brighton, Jo Bunner, she um, does the same thing with altering clothes, buying charity shops, altering, changing stuff up. So all over the country, I know a lot of people, yeah. more people are much more aware of this. Yeah, exactly. But the question I have for you now, Mika, is... Not only are you very for Fashion Revolution Week and ethical clothing, but you're actually in marketing of a sort, aren't you? So how do you <laughs> combine the ethical with the marketing? Uh, well, no, I'm a copywriter, mm -hmm. so that's my trade. Um, so I help people write the words for their businesses. Okay. And I've recently started working with more local people and small businesses and doing a little bit of consulting just to make sure that people um, kind of are, are looking at their business from the right angle. Because you'd be surprised at how many people start off with kind of missing out building block number one. They go straight to building block two or even three or four. And then they're kind of trying to construct their roof and like, oh, it's not sitting together just right and I don't know. Or what. And then they come to me and say, will you fix my copy? And you think, no. <laughs> <laughs> Rewrite. No. <laughs> started from the wrong place. That's why it's not working. Yeah. Um, and then for, you know, bigger brands who simply don't have the time to write, mm -hmm. I do their actual writing. Okay. So that's what I do for a living. Um, and I came into that via fashion. So I worked in fashion when I first left university and I, I worked 
pretty much exclusively doing copywriting and marketing within the fashion industry, which is how I came to have all of this knowledge. And then I started working only with designers who work ethically and sustainably. And I still feel more angry about the fast fashion mm. kind of movement that's taken over. So I call myself an fa uh, ethical fashion advocate. So I speak up about it as much as possible and I'll get involved in anything going on. Um, I will use my powers for good. And <laughs> what is your superpower, Mika? Well, that's interesting. My superpower is that I can make words work harder Ooh. than most people. But like a slave mm. driver, just like a supercharged <laughs> one. <laughs> you are a you are pull, add the sparkle and a brrrr to them. Uh, no, I've got, like, my, my weapon of choice is the thesaurus. So, yeah, the fact I that you say that is quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite cool. It's a nice word to say, actually, yeah. and when I use it, I think, mm, this is a job for the thesaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Ta -ta <-ta. laughs> no, yes. And that feels kind of like a superpower, because when you get it just right, yeah. you think, ah, oh, I found that one word. You don't have to use those 20 mediocre like words. Like finely tailored clothing. Yes, exactly that. Fits. Yeah. She's like a genius. The thesaurus it clothing. It all comes together. <laughs> so uh, the other thing I do is that ha sort of watching my child grow up and having a friend who has a daughter the same age and very similar interests and is likewise ranty, um, <laughs> we got to a point where we said, actually, you know, we go to so much effort to find really good brands, especially for our kids. And my daughter always had eczema when she was growing up, so I would try and find, you know, lots of organic cotton clothing. And again, when you have the information, you feel some sort of obligation to share it because it's really, really important. And when you talk about organic cotton, especially for children, there are health implications because, of course, your skin is a very absorbent organ. Um, so we decided we would put our efforts and money where our mouth is and we opened a little web shop called Asphalt Flowers. We specifically support brands who make children's clothing and they are sustainable and ethical and they're usually, you know, doing like a bit more than just being neutral. They're, they, they're usually designing and behaving at a sort of at a level that we think is really exciting and interesting so we sell kids clothes through our website which is just oh, wow. a fun thing to do and sometimes when the copywriting mm. feels a bit dry i've got that other bit of work that always is interesting and fun so we want to know a little bit more and we've got a couple of questions for you that are a normal kind of random mm. good yeah. what's your question go What's the scariest thing you've ever done? Oh, actually, the scariest <laughs> thing I've ever done was, it was by accident. I went on a, a ride at um, a fairground. I think it was when I went with my daughter and her friend, and her friend's mum is my friend. We had a girl's trip to Copenhagen, and we went to Tivoli. And went on all the rides, it was really, really good fun. And even though it was a lovely bright sunny Saturday it just never gets that crowded <laughs> so we'd go on a ride and it'd be so much fun we'd just go and queue again because the queues were only five or ten minutes um, and then we saw this ride that looked really good but it was quite high up and kind of spun round a bit and and our, the, our two young girls wanted to go on it and my friend said oh well I can't I can't go spinny spinny because I go blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I was like all right I'll go with the girls so I don't mind that sort of thing and there were two cues and because I I'm too stupid <laughs> and I only speak English and I couldn't work out why there were two cues or what it meant so we just sort of went <laughs> and we went into that queue and that was the queue to go on the the bit where you're sort of on the outside, i.e. the really flipping mm. scary bit. <laughs> and it was just a fairground ride. But I, I mean, I was viscerally terrified. <laughs> I mean, I just never felt so scared. Wow. And the girls were fine, but we were kind of, you know, strapped in and then just hanging like that. And then you went further and further up and then you went round and round. And I had the, an 11 year old here and an 11 year old here and I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> and it was 
I mean, yeah, that's, I think, one of the few times that that I felt a little bit kind of not in control of my body. Like, I thought, I might vomit out of terror. <laughs> it was so horrible. So the other very important question we'd like to ask everybody ever in the whole world mm. is what is your favourite game or way to play? Okay, so like a little bit predictable, but really genuinely, I like Scrabble. Like, I really like Scrabble. You are word queen, aren't you? You're like <laughs> I'm, I'm a, super power word person. I'm a bit person. wordy, and I mean, but my mum is like really good at Scrabble. Have you ever beaten her? Like, occasionally, but then you can never tell if she's let you win. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it just, it kind of is like, I think she can tell if she wins again, it'll stop being fun. And so I think she kind of. <laughs> All parents do. I can't tell, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, no, I, and anyway, I just think that's really. Fun. I know it's not like a massively dynamic game, but, but it's your way to play with words. Um, I, I'm not massively keen on all board games. Everyone's like, "Hey, let's play a board game," and I'll go. Wants to play Scrabble. Nice. Just keep your thesaurus in your pocket, just no, so you can have no, a little. Because in Scrabble, there's a special Scrabble dictionary. And, it, and you can use all these like two letter words and three letter words that aren't in the Didn't you know this existed yeah. to anybody else? Did you know that no. AA is a word? It's not. It's a type of lava. I get a bit sort of competitive, so mm. if it's information that I don't need for points, I don't care. <laughs> I like it. Can I do that? Can I do Clearly Mika's way to play. Competitive wording. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite cool. <laughs> yeah, he wants That's to play That's why you want to use a reminder. <laughs> we never play Scrabble with me. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, you. And, um, having me. Despite the recording, not <laughs> everything required. Um, so that's the lovely Mika Lam and all the things she does and the amazing hidden gem that she is with all the secret the Thor things hiding in her <laughs> pockets. Um, but yeah, we do these so we remind you that you are your best way to play and to enjoy that because life is your playground. Play it your way. Correct. Right, everybody, oh, to camera, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch.